Okay. Well, again, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. Um, we are learning, um, and thanks to Kelly, our speaker, we're learning about introduction to CCBHCs, transforming Illinois behavioral health. And hopefully we can, um, you know, learn about mental health wards and what we can expect to see in our communities. Um, our speaker today is Kelly Epperson, and she is the Chief of Staff and General Counsel at Rosecrans Behavioral Health. Um, Kelly joined Rosecrans in 2015 and is currently responsible for the legal, compliance, public policy, grant management, strategic planning, and performance improvement functions at Rosecrans. As Chief of Staff and General Counsel, Kelly provided comprehensive legal services to Ro Rosecrans and its affiliates including direct directing corporate activities to protect Rosecrans's legal interests, assisting with mergers and acquisitions, analyzing novel legal issues and uniquely that uniquely impact behavioral health care providers, researching and influencing legislative changes at the state and federal levels, and positioning Rosecrans to be a legally sound not-for-profit so it can continue to fill, fulfill its mission. Kelly is a 2008 graduate of Northern Illinois University College of Law, where she was symposium editor of the Law Review, Moot Court Chief Justice, and received the Outstanding Woman Student Award. Prior to law school, she received a bachelor's degree from the University of Wisconsin in Madison. And we thank her so much for joining us today and giving us some information. Um, again, we are recording this session. We'll send it out to members. You can share it um, to, your, to your own board and staff and whatnot. Um, we'll also, um, Kelly is okay with doing questions throughout. So if you do have a question, please um, post it in the chat box or raise your hand and we'll be monitoring that. And um, with that, I would just like to turn it over to Kelly. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Jody. That was a lovely introduction. Um, thank you everyone for sharing your lunch with me. I appreciate you taking the time to be here. Um, as Jody said, I'm happy to answer questions as we go. This can be interactive and more of a conversation. Um, so with that, let me share my screen. Do you see a PowerPoint presentation? I do, yes. And are you seeing the big one or like the presenter's view? Presenter's view. Oh boy. Let me see. <laughs> Well, present of you and slideshow. What about that? There you go. Perfect. Okay. Wonderful. Thanks for the help. Yep. Um, so Jody introduced me. Um, I am Chief of Staff and General Counsel here at Rosecrans, but I did want to take just a couple minutes and introduce Rosecrans real quick. I'm sure a lot of you know Ro Rosecrans, but we have changed in the last couple of years. Um, so we do provide a full care continuum. Um, over in that top left, you have our residential services. We have four main residential campuses that are providing really comprehensive, holistic approach for both substance use disorder and mental health services. Um, in our therapies line, that's that middle box on the left, our therapies line is the most personal level of outpatient care. That's typically one-on-one -on -one, um, individual services uh, for things like depression, anxiety, grief, trauma. We also offer some group services um, through our Rosecrans Therapies line. Rosecrans Community is our community-based services. Those are really comprehensive services provided out in the community. Things like ACT, CST, um, group services offered in the community. Up in the top right, we have Rosecrans Living. Those are for people who are in the early stages of their recovery journey who might not want to jump full back into their home environment. They want more of a structured, sober environment. Um, so that's where you would find recovery homes, also supportive living um, programs for people that might have a mental health diagnosis. In that middle one on the right, that's our Rosecrans Learning. Those are all kinds of different resources, programs, and education for individuals and families to gain understanding and expertise around behavioral health care. And then finally in that bottom right is our Rosecrans Foundation. That is our charitable giving arm so that we can ensure there are resources for anybody who needs behavioral health care. This is our current footprint. So Rosecrans does operate in three states now. I'm sure most of you are familiar with our Illinois-based services. 
Uh, we do span most of Northern Illinois from both borders down to Champaign, Rantoul, and Danville. Our CCBHCs are located in the Rockford area, the Champaign area, and then we have a third CCBHC out in Sioux City, Iowa. So that's our current footprint, about 60 different locations. We do offer additional services that I haven't talked about, including adolescent care, services specifically for first responders and veterans. We also have uh, programming specific for women with children where they can actually bring their children into treatment with them. In addition, we offer gambling uh, services for gambling and other process addictions, medication assisted treatment, interventions, and then TMS. So TMS is transcranial magnetic stimulation. So it's like an MRI machine and it stimulates different parts of the brain. Right now it's approved for depression, anxiety, and OCD. There's a lot of uh, other treatments on the, uh, on the horizon though for TMS. This is just a snapshot of Rosecrans last year. We served 54,000 patients. Of that, about 25,000 were children, 30,000 were adults, on any given day, we have over 11,000 people enrolled in services at Rosecrans. Um, so there's our beds, our outpatient groups, and of course, about 60 locations across all three states with a total workforce of 1,300. So let's talk CCBHC. Um, the history of this is that it was first created by federal law called the Protecting Access to Medicare Act. That law passed in 2014 and it created the CCBHC model. At that time, eight states were selected to pilot the CCBHC model. Um, those states were, I've got the list in my notes, Minnesota, Missouri, Nevada, New Jersey, New York, Oklahoma, Oregon, and Pennsylvania. Those states first piloted the CCBHC model in 2016. Since then, we've continued to have federal laws passed to support this model. So a lot of people will ask me like, is this CCBHC model gonna stick around? I think the answer is yes, and partly because we keep having these federal laws passed to support the CCBHC model. So in 2018, the Support Act passed that increased the amount of time that the demonstrations could operate. The CARES Act in 2020, um, expanded the demonstration state, allowed more states to enter, and then also put additional funding behind it. Uh, the most recent law that we had passed at the federal level was the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act that passed in 2022. The reason that was such a big deal is it expanded the number of states that can participate in this demonstration. So every time we're talking about the CCBHC demonstration, we're talking about a Medicaid project that allows states to use different strategies to pay for behavioral health care. And so this demonstration is a way for states to go and try new things. The federal government has to pay its fair share though. So that's why they're limiting it um, to how many, you know, to a certain number of states that can participate in it. They wanna test drive this model before they expand it to all states. So the good news is 10 new states can join um, every two years. So we continue to see a lot of federal support for the CCBHC model. We also have state support for the model. So back in 2021, there was a state law that passed called the Illinois CCBHC Act um, that required HFS as the Illinois Medicaid Authority to create a CCBHC pilot program. In addition to that act, there was also a $10 million appropriation to help CCBHCs get started and to continue their service. So there are two CCBHC models. I talked about the medication demonstration that's here on the left side. That's where you're truly changing Medicaid and the way Medicaid pays for behavioral health care services. Because it's a Medicaid demonstration, there's really no limit on the amount of funding. This is gonna be run through the federal agencies, CMS and SAMHSA and the state Medicaid authority, which here in Illinois is HFS. So Illinois HFS is going to regulate this because they're the state Medicaid authority. The certification guidelines will come through SAMHSA and then anything related to Medicaid payment will come through CMS as that federal authority in charge of Medicaid. 
the eligibility is limited for that Medicaid demonstration. First, it was originally those eight states, but now 10 new states have been added, including Illinois, so that's great news. The payment structure is completely different. So under current Medicaid, we have this fee-for-service payment structure where you provide one unit of service, you get paid one rate, fee-for-service, so it's a volume game. Under this new payment structure, it is a PPS, which stands for Prospective Payment Rate Based on the Encounter. This is a really important change for providers because everything is going to be cost-based now. And so providers should get paid at their cost of delivery and service. On the grant side, um, this is really a grant program coming directly from the federal government. So I bring this up because you've probably heard of people that are CCBHCs, just know there's two different models out there. There might be a CCBHC because they got a grant from the federal government, or they could be a CCBHC because they're actually participating in the Illinois Medicaid demonstration. Some providers are both. Some providers have different locations in each bucket, um, but the SAMHSA grant was an application directly to the federal government. Those grants are limited by what's ever in the federal budget. So. I can't remember the last couple of years, but it's been in the hundreds of millions, if I remember correctly. And then SAMHSA takes that money, rolls out the grants. It's usually a couple hundred um, grantees that get in. Everything is direct through SAMHSA. So if you're the CCBHC grantee, you're gonna work directly with SAMHSA to administer this grant funding. Um, eligibility is specific to uh, that clinic. So if you as a provider can meet the CCBHC standards, you can apply to SAMHSA for a grant. It doesn't matter if your state is in the Medicaid demonstration or it's not. So when you look at the hundreds of CCBHCs nationwide, some are gonna be in this medication demonstration, some are gonna be a SAMHSA grantee. It was just a way to expand the CCBHC model and get people and providers and clinics ready for CCBHC even if their state was not participating in the Medicaid demonstration. So what is a CCBHC? It is a different type of behavioral health provider. It's really kind of a new classification, a new facility type, a new license type. It is this different category of behavioral health provider. And with that different type or that different category of being a provider, you have different obligations. You have to provide different services, you have to meet the strict certification standards, but then of course the payment is different as well. So as a CCBHC, you're required to provide these comprehensive integrated mental health and substance use disorder services. The goal of the CCBHC was to take mental health and substance use disorder treatment and deliver it in a really integrated and comprehensive way. So instead of a patient having to go to one clinic for their mental health services and then go to a separate clinic for their addiction treatment, now you've got one provider providing all of those services in a really like comprehensive, cohesive way. The CCBHC also increases access to services, including crisis care. When that federal law first passed back in 2014, the, the PAMA, P-A-M-A, they noticed that there was a lack of access to behavioral health care services. And so one of the goals in creating this new model was to increase access to services, especially med Medicaid funded services and publicly funded services. Kelly, we do have a question from the previous screen with the two models. The question is, if an agency is a CCBHC, do they have to be one of these models or were there, were there just certain agencies selected in Illinois to participate in the Medicaid? demonstration. If you're calling yourself a CCBHC, it's one of these two models. I can't think of like a third or a fourth way to be recognized as a CCBHC. Um, so if you have a provider or a grantee that's calling themselves a CCBHC, it's one of these two things. It could be both. Um, so just for example, Rosecrans's services, we received grants three years ago now. We did those CCBHC grants, got up to the certification standards, ex, uh, expanded services. Now those grants are ending. We're now gonna be a Medicaid demonstration. You can do both at the same time where you've got grant funds coming in from SAMHSA and you're working with Illinois HFS to uh, change, you know, to build Medicaid. 
I think that gets really complicated. I know providers are doing it. Um, the, the lawyer part of me worries about the risk um, because you've got both of these fundings coming in, um, but you can do both at the same time. You could also have, have a provider that has like a grantee location in Chicago and then a demonstration location in Rockford, for example. It is a location-based kind of certification, not a provider. So it's not all of Rosecrans is a CCBHC, but we have specific locations that are recognized as CCBHCs. Thank you. The other part about CCBHC, so they're gonna provide all these services. They're gonna integrate those services really well. Um, it's going to be person-centered, so whatever that person needs, they're going to drive their care, um, drive the treatment plan. The treatment plan is going to include those evidence-based services, and then the CCBHC has to provide services to anyone seeking help, regardless of where they live or their ability to pay. So that is very different um, for providers than what the standard is today. So again, this really increases access to services to people who need behavioral health care and otherwise wouldn't be avail uh, able to access services. So it is different than kind of business as usual. There's this strict certification criteria. I've got some slides on it later um, in the presentation. It's uh, the certification criteria is organized into six different domains. It's about 150 standards across all of those domains. So think of it as like, first you're gonna get licensed, say under rule 2060 to provide addiction treatment. Then you might have to get enrolled in impact and follow rule 140 to bill Medicaid. On top of all of that, you're gonna have this extra certification criteria to be a CCBHC. In my head, it's almost like another joint commission or CARF accreditation. It is that kind of level of standards that CCBHCs have to meet. And again, they're providing that integrated behavioral health care, both mental health and addiction treatment. The other thing that's different from business as usual is that CCBHCs have to focus on physical health conditions. So they're going to be doing some primary care screening and really focusing on the whole person and all of their needs. So we'll be assessing for social determinants of health, does someone have safe housing? Do they have access to nutritional food? Do they need transportation to get into their services? Really focusing on that whole person and what they need to be able to improve their well being. That's going to take a whole team approach. And so there should be really good care coordination among that whole team. The case manager should be talking to the psychiatrist who's talking to the therapist, and that whole team is working together to meet the person's needs as that person has defined them for themselves. The other thing that's different is now we have this obligation to be responsive to community needs. I hope all the providers um, and grantees that you work with are responding to community needs. This takes that concept one step further. So at the beginning of the whole CCBHC process, providers are required to do a community needs assessment really study that community specifically, identify who the population is, what conditions are most prevalent, what are the language barriers, what are the cultural um, demographics, and then develop a service array and a staffing plan that meets that community's needs. That service array and staffing plan should address health disparities. And we have seen success with the CCBHC model doing outreach to uh, segments of the population that have been historically underserved. If you do all that, you do get paid through a cost-based encounter rate that should pay for your cost as a provider. As I mentioned, CCBHC is a, is a different provider because you do have to provide all nine core services. You have to provide crisis services that are available 24 seven. Screening assessment and diagnosis and treatment planning. I think those are probably pretty standard for providers today. You have to provide both the outpatient mental health and addiction treatment. We talked about the primary care screening. So you're now gonna be monitoring things like the patient's BMI, their blood pressure, their diabetes risk, and then expected to take action on if, um, if any of those screenings show something uh, concerning. 
providers also have to provide case management and psychiatric rehabilitation services. Under the psychiatric re rehabilitation services, that category can be kind of broad um, because it's really anything that helps people achieve recovery, improve their functioning, and reintegrate into the community, improve their well being. So, things in the psychiatric rehabilitation category include skill development, helping people with their daily living skills, managing medications, budgeting, cooking, things like that, uh, support for independent living illness and wellness management, peer support services, community integration, coordinating with other health services. It can also include family support and education. So that is a very big category, but it will really be driven by the client's assessment and their treatment plan. CCBHCs are required to offer peer support and family supports. And then finally, um, the last core service is that in, uh, CCBHCs offer intensive community-based services for veterans. So as you can see, it's a big lift for a provider. You have to have all of these nine services. There is an option to provide the services through a designated collaborating organization. They're called DCOs. I think sometimes it's hard to work in behavioral health care because everything feels like an acronym. So if I start speaking too much in acronyms, please raise your hand, let me know. Um, but a DCO is a designated collaborating organization. So instead of the CCBHC providing the services in-house, you can contract with another provider to be your DCO. That DCO relationship though, it's more than just a care coordination agreement or a linkage agreement. There's really all of the standards that apply to the CCBHC also apply to the DCO. So that DCO is held to a very high standard as well and must meet all of the CCBHC standards. The other big difference is kind of the payment mechanism. The DCO is not going to bill Medicaid directly. The CCBHC purchases services from the DCO and so it's actually the responsibility of the CCBHC to bill Medicaid and then pay the DCO for those services. But this is an option if, if a CCBHC can't provide all nine services in-house, you can partner with the DCO and provide the services that way. So that might be a term that you hear as you're having these conversations about CCBHCs. You might say, hey, provider, are you a CCBHC? And they say, no, but I'm DCOing for other people. DCO has now become a verb. Um, so you might hear that term DCO. The certification criteria is really a big difference. So it's a high standard for providers to meet. You have these six domains covering staffing, availability and accessibility of services, care coordination, scope of services, that section four scope of services, that's where all the detail is on what services you're offering, and then quality and governance. So those are the six domains. Within each domain, there's a ton of standards about how you deliver services and making sure that you're meeting the highest benchmark. But if you meet all of those standards and if you're in compliance and doing everything right, you do have access to this prospective payment system. So this is really what I think is a game changer for providers because it will allow us to provide more comprehensive services and get paid to deliver those services. I think what's hard today is with Medicaid paying below cost, that doesn't leave anything at the end of the day to really expand services, be innovative, you know, hire more staff to meet the community needs. Under this new model, you are incentivized to expand services to meet community needs. Um, you are incentivized to study the community, see what populations are underserved, and then design a service array just to reach that population. The way, so this PPS, another acronym for you, stands for Prospective Payment System. It is a per encounter rate that's based on the cost of delivering service. It doesn't matter what services you're providing, you're gonna get paid the same rate for any qualifying encounter, and that's a defined term. So you could provide five hours of psychiatric care, 30 minutes of case management, you're gonna get paid the same rate. So instead of a volume-based game, 
you're really paid to deliver that comprehensive care for whatever a patient needs. And if they need five hours of case management on one day, you provide that five hours of case management on that day because you're gonna improve the outcome, right? If you address the transportation barriers, the primary care barriers, and do all of that in this really comprehensive integrated way, ideally that patient's gonna get better and it's gonna save the system money at the end of the day and providers will get judged on outcomes at the end of the day. So that's the other big thing. Um, <laughs> a Medicaid official said it to me best where they said, we're gonna invest a ton of money in this CCBHC system, but we expect to see improved outcomes at the end of the day. Um, so that's why people are putting so much money into this. It's more preventative care. They expect people to get better at the end of the day. So we hope to see hospitalizations down, um, jail time down, ER visits down, all of that should decrease. And so hopefully the state and the federal government will save money in the long run. There are multiple PPS rates. So as you um, have conversations about CCBHC, you might hear PPS1, PPS2. There's actually four PPS rates now, um, just to make it as complicated as possible. It's based on the four variables are whether it's a daily rate or a monthly rate and whether crisis is included or not included. Illinois has chosen to go with PPS1. And so that is a daily encounter rate and crisis services are included. The way you get your daily encounter rate, this is the lawyer's explanation of the accounting, is you take all of your costs for the whole year all eligible costs for the year. You divide that by the total of qualifying CCBHC visits, and that's gonna spit out your daily encounter rate. Every provider's rate will be different. Every location's rate will be different. So at Rosecrans, we have two CCBHCs here in Illinois. They have different rates because they have different costs and a different number of visits. So. Um, providers are kind of finalizing those rates right now for the Illinois Medicaid demonstration. And then those get recalculated. Now I'm forgetting if it's every year or every two years, but they will get recalculated to see, did you hit all the costs you expected to hit? Did you hit all the visits you expect to hit? So that's called rebasing. And we'll get uh, a new PPS rate after we have some time in the Medicaid demonstration. In Illinois, I think we have about 20 providers with 26 different CCBHC locations. That number changes and can go up or down kind of from month to month. So take that as a ballpark, but we do have a significant number of CCBHCs in Illinois. HFS applied to be part of the Medicaid demonstration. That application was submitted in March, 2024. And great news, Illinois is in. So Illinois was selected as one of the 10 states to be part of the demonstration. Because they were selected, they can now change Medicaid. They can pay for services that were never reimbursed be before. So it is a very exciting time. We really are able to transform um, behavioral health care in Illinois and pay for services we've never paid before and incentivize providers in a way we've never been able to before, all with the goal of people getting better. The go live date for our CCBHC demonstration is October 1. So if you have any providers or grantees that are a little bit more stressed than usual, it's because we're all working for this October 1 go live date. And Rosecrans, I'm happy to report, did have two CCBHC sites selected uh, for the demonstration project. So Champaign County, Winnebago County. Uh, right now, I think there are 18 sites that Illinois is trying to get certified for the demonstration project. That's on the high end. So Illinois is doing a huge lift by trying to get 18 sites certified. Um, it's, I think most other states are at like eight to 10 sites. That, the, that's the number of sites that were submitted with Illinois' initial application to CMS. They will have a process to let more sites in. So I don't, they haven't announced um, when that process will open back up. We know the federal government allows it quarterly. That's probably too frequently because it's a huge lift. 
Um, so we don't have all of that detail yet from the state, but we do know more sites will be able to apply and get into this model. All right, questions. We have a question about, do we know all the locations of the 18 sites in Illinois? We do. Can I drop it in the chat? Well, yes, please. No pressure. Whenever. Thank you. Yeah, I don't know how to exit my slide, go to Google and then do all of that. But here's what I can tell you. If you search Illinois HFS CCDHC, you're going to get to HFS's main CCDHC website. And then you'll be able to click on the list of providers. And if you can't find it, I can definitely send that out afterwards. HFS stands for, ooh, good question, healthcare, health and family services, healthcare and family services. I've said HFS so many times, I've almost forgotten what it stands for. Um, does anybody know? I think it's healthcare and family services. Yeah, I, I think I, yeah, I put it in there. Department oh. of Healthcare and Family Services, yep. Thank you. Yep, and HFS website will have the list of all um, 18 services, uh, 18 sites. So all of the providers had to submit applications to get in. Then it was about over Christmas that we submitted our cost reports and that's where we put all of our anticipated costs for what it will cost to run a CCBHC, our number of visits. So we worked on that all over Christmas and New Year's. Then we submitted all of the information to show how we met the certification standards. So it was like standard 1A.1. How do you show that you provide person-centered treatment planning? You know, criteria this, this, and this. Then over the summer, once Illinois got um, awarded as a demonstration state in July, most providers had their on-site visits where HFS and their team came on site um, to go through providers, make sure they're ready for this, make sure they're meeting all the standards. And then now HFS is doing all of this technical guidance where they're doing weekly phone calls, monthly calls, um, really to help providers meet these standards and be successful with CCBHC. Why are we doing all this work? I think that's the important question, right? And like I said, at the end of the day, we want people to get better. We're trying to increase access to care. We know that especially for people with Medicaid or people without funding, it can be hard to get access to behavioral health care. Another goal was just to integrate that mental health and addiction treatment, make sure they're being delivered in a comprehensive way. We want to be able to stabilize people with access to crisis services, focus on collaborative care, focus on getting people better on that recovery wellness, and trauma-informed care. We want to meet the needs of the community and improve outcomes. So how are we doing with that? Because this model's been around since 2016 now. Um, the good news is that it, people are getting access to care. So this is from National Council uh, for Mental Health, for Mental Wellbeing. They publish a lot of reports on CCBHC. So if you ever want to kind of look at what's going on with CCBHC, National Council is a great resource. So over 3 million people have been served through CCBHCs. When providers become a CCBHC, they increase the number of people served by an average of 33%. I think that's a great number. It means that just by becoming a CCBHC, you serve 33% more people. We're also adding staff. Um, so over 11,000 staff have been added, which is about a median of 15 new staff for CCBHC that was on the grantee side. On the demonstration side, I think it was closer to 22 staff per added per CCBHC location. A lot of those, most of those staff are clinical staff, doctors, nurses, case managers, therapists. Because of that new rate, because the services are being paid for, you can add staff to deliver those services. If peer support was never paid for before, but now you have a reimbursement model that covers peer support services, you as the provider can add all of those services and deliver it. And again, that really comprehensive team-based approach. A lot of the services are happening in the community. I think that matters because it goes to accessibility and availability. If you're seeing the patient where they are, that increases access to care. 
As far as outcomes, uh, National Council's reporting a 72% reduction in hospitalization, 40% reduction in homelessness, and 60% less time in jail. All of those metrics are huge for our communities and in increasing um, the quality of care. Now, the other thing about that federal law I mentioned that passed in 2014, PAMA, Protecting Access to Medicare Act, they have to, the federal government has to submit a report to Congress every year. So annually, HHS, which is a federal government that stands for Health and Human Services, they're submitting a report about CCBHC. I went to go read the report and I was a little bit disappointed because I thought we were gonna get this really like longitudinal data that showed people are getting better. We're not quite there yet. So some of these metrics are more about, yeah, people served, access to services, all of that matters. I'm just really hoping that we also get kind of the longitudinal data to show people are getting better. So 94% uh, of CCBHCs are offering open access or same day scheduling. What a great thing for access to services. I know in community mental health, we've talked about long wait lists for a long time. Now CCBHCs are offering same day access to services. Again, a lot of those services are happening out in the community, in homes and schools and other agencies to increase access to care. The number of people continues to go up. In the 2023 report on CCBHC to Congress, the one thing they noted was workforce. So CCBHCs have rapidly expanded services. Workforce has not necessarily kept up. We need to keep adding behavioral health providers so that we can keep expanding the services that clients need to get better. So 90% of CCBHCs reported difficulties with staffing and workforce development. This is where the state has stepped in and tried to assist CCBHCs by um, hiring experts, providing more training um, among current staff so that current staff can offer more interventions. I think it's a really good conversation to have though how do we continue building capacity? How do we build the workforce to continue developing and delivering these services? The report also talked about quality of care. Um, so this is straight from the federal report, not from Kelly, but CCBHCs offer higher quality care than other providers because of that commitment to care coordination and evidence-based practices. So it is being reported as a better and more higher and a higher quality care model. The report talked about building EHR, that stands for electronic health record, um, building the capacity of like our health record to pull accurate data for quality reporting. So right now our health record will talk about a patient while they're in services with us. And we can pull a lot of data on their PHQ-9, their BAM, their GAD7, are they getting better? What we don't quite have today though is that longitudinal data of how many times did they go to the hospital? Were they arrested? Did they visit the ER? So I think we're still building some of those systems to see how patients do in the long term. But as we build that capacity, then we'll be able to pull a lot more of that data to show a, a person's life, um, show their improvement over their lifespan. In the report to Congress, um, the CCBHCs were talked about really doing well on increasing their suicidality screening and the follow-up on that, um, improving substance use disorder services, um, screening for that like in mental health programs, and then again, following up. That's the integrated part of saying, hey, I have this patient in ACT, they're talking about using substances, let's have the ACT team do a screening and then connect with the SUD team to deliver, you know, to put together a treatment plan for that patient and deliver comprehensive services. The other big area of focus was that primary care screening. So if you're seeing a person for depression and anxiety, why not talk about their blood pressure and the BMI? Why not make sure that they're in with primary care and getting those physical health needs met? And then lastly, one of the areas of focus has been that psychiatric uh, medication compliance and making sure that people are supported in taking their medications. So over time, I expect to see more longitudinal outcomes with this model. 
Um, but so far, both National Council and the reports to Congress are showing a lot of goals being met with this care delivery model. Let me check questions real quick if there's anything new. Oh, thank you for finding the list of locations. Um, I'm gonna jump into the certification criteria and this is where I'm gonna go a little bit faster. Um, mainly I wanted you to have the slides of reference material kind of after the fact. So I think we'll be able to share the slides. You'll have this available. But really I wanted to demonstrate what is so different about this model. And it really comes down to the certification criteria and the higher standards that CPDHC are required to meet. It's organized in six buckets. Bucket one is about the needs assessment. So CCBHCs have to go through a very detailed process, really study the community, the population, the behavioral health needs that are present in the population, and then design services that meet the needs of the community. So rather than me moving into a community, popping open an addiction treatment center and offering group therapy, first I have to stop study the community, see what the needs are, and then design the services to meet the needs. That has to be done every three years. It has to include input from community partners. So I'm guessing you're gonna hear from your providers and grantees, you know, as the 708 board to help facilitate this process, um, to get your input on the process and really hear from the 708 boards and the mental health boards, what needs they see from their perspective. That should then, it should really be like a strategic planning process. You do your needs assessment, that drives your service array, that drives your staffing plan, which then feeds into your budget and your goals for the year. Bucket two is all about availability and access to services. I think this one's really important because now you have a requirement to provide services within one business day if someone has an urgent need. If they have more of a routine need, you have to provide services within 10 business days. So this is specifically designed to address problems with waiting lists. People should be able to get into services more quickly. This is gonna be the standard, but <laughs> providers will need time to build capacity. We'll have to hire a workforce, expand services, build capacity, but this is the standard that we are expected to be held to. Crisis services have to be available 24 seven. There's also standards that we have to work closely with hospitals, emergency departments and law enforcement so that those crisis services de-escalate um, and that we're working closely with those institutions to get people into the care they need. If the underlying issue is a behavioral health crisis, let's get that person into the CCBHC to address the behavioral health diagnosis so that they don't cycle through the emergency department or interact with law enforcement. Also in standard two is that we cannot refuse services due to inability to pay. We have to serve everybody regardless of their ability to pay. So that affects like the, there has to be a sliding fee discount schedule, which I think is something that most mental health boards require already. Um, but now it's institutionalized for the CCBHCs as well. We also have to provide services regardless of residence. Standard three is all about care coordination. So we have to coordinate care both internally and externally with other systems to meet the client needs. So it's not enough to just the CCBHC team to get together and talk about the patient's care. We also have to be proactive and talk to all of the external parties who are involved with the patient's care to make a, this comprehensive treatment plan and meet the patient's needs. It also includes things like accessing public benefits like Medicaid or other public assistance. We have to improve our electronic health record so that we can talk to other people. So our health record should talk to the hospital's health record. And how do we do that in a really good way while maintaining all privacy standards? We have to have partnerships with the FQHCs and other entities uh, we have to track when patients are admitted to other facilities. 
The CCBHC model is focused on outpatient care and covers outpatient services, but we still have a responsibility to patients who are admitted to inpatient facilities. As soon as they're in, admitted to that inpatient facility, we should be working on a care coordination plan, discharge plan. How do we get them safely back to the community? How do we make sure the outpatient services are in place when they're discharged? Um, so we have to work with a variety of entities, including the school, welfare agencies, criminal justice agencies, um, human service organizations, hospitals. It should really be a community-based and an ecosystem approach to a patient's care. Standard four is the biggest standard. It's all about services. This is where you're going to see the services defined is in this bucket four. We've already talked about the nine core services. We've talked about DCOs. Um, the second standard that 4B is that it all has to be person-centered care. So this should not be the provider telling the patient what they need. This should be the patient self-directing their care, um, articulating their goals for treatment, and then that should be reflected in the treatment plan. All of the services have to be culturally sensitive as well and responsive to race, ethnicity, sexual orientation, and gender identity. Crisis services, um, under this standard, CCBHCs are expected to provide crisis intervention, mobile crisis, and crisis stabilization. There are response times. So right now under MCR, you have to respond within 90 minutes. Under the CCBHC standards, their expectation is that it's one hour for urban standards, two settings, two hours for rural settings. We're going to have to work through this as a state a little bit because this crisis is probably the hardest one where we're going to have to integrate a lot of different programs. We have the 590 grants, which are responding to 988. We have mobile crisis services that are all governed by HFS. And now you're going to layer a set, um, another set of rules and regulations from the CCBHC. We'll have to do some kind of digesting and make sure all those standards are playing nice together. What will be a little bit different is that the services now need to include kind of an SUD crisis response, including overdose response and support. I think historically our crisis services have been a little bit more mental health focused. Now there is um, an expectation and responsibility that if it's an SUD crisis, an addiction crisis of some kind, that you're also providing a response to that SUD addiction crisis. Illinois took the CCBHC opportunity. Oh, I probably didn't explain this well. The certification criteria is coming through SAMHSA, uh, the Federal Agency for Mental Health and Addiction Treatment. So SAMHSA published the certification for CCBHCs nationwide. All CCBHCs are held to that standard. Illinois, when they applied to be part of the demonstration, added some additional standards. These are the Illinois additional standards. Um, so we have to provide MCR crisis intervention, crisis stabilization. Those are pretty standard. This is the big ad within 12 months, we have to provide, oh, I'm missing a slide. Okay, so I missed a couple things on this slide. Within 12 months, so you have to integrate those SUD protocols anytime you're responding, responding to crisis services. We also um, have to ensure access to medication-assisted recovery. So that would be your medication-assisted treatment like Suboxone, um, it could be Methadone, it could be Vivitrol. How do you ensure access to those medications within 24 hours of an SUD crisis event? The other big lift is that CCBHCs will now have to provide behavioral health urgent care and behavioral health crisis stabilization. The urgent care is like a 24-hour triage model. So people would be able to come in and have up to 24 hours of observation. Crisis stabilization is more of a short-term residential type model. I think they've described it as three to seven days. The urgent care and the crisis stabilization have not been fully defined and built out by the state yet. Those will be services that we add in the second and third year. I bring it up because I think it, you kind of see what the state's trying to do here. 
they saw a gap in crisis services and they're using CCBHC to fill that gap and say, with crisis services, you need someone to call, someone to answer, somewhere to go. Let's build out the urgent care and the crisis stabilization using the CCBHC model because then we have that sustainable funding model for those services. Screening assessment, pretty straightforward. You have to use the IM CANS. Um, it has to be updated every so often. Within 12 months, CCBHCs will have to offer a neuropsychological evaluation. So that will be a new service offered to the CCBHC population. Treatment planning, um, also a little bit more um, how we're doing it today. You have to use person-centered and family-centered treatment planning. These are the outpatient mental health and SUD services that have to be offered by the CCBHC or a DCO. Um, so you have to offer all of the HFS Rule 140 services and ASAM Level 1 and 2, including treatment of tobacco use disorders. On the medical side, you have to offer the physical health screening and referral for primary health conditions. So that's medication monitoring, vitals, and BMI monitoring. And within 12 months um, in that year two, there will be additional requirements to provide lab testing. Case management, I think, is pretty straightforward. On um, the psychiatric rehabilitation services, this is a long list of things that the CCBHC can offer. It should be driven really by what the patient needs and what the community needs. So this is where you might see a little bit more variation from provider to provider and community to community. But again, we wanna offer all those comprehensive wraparound services so that patients are getting better. We're meeting their needs, they can get access to services and we're supporting their long-term recovery. Under this bucket, Illinois added some additional requirements for providers. So you have to add, um, offer the CBT, RAP services, motivational interviewing. One of the team-based, I forgot what MRO stands for, I'm sorry, um, but I do know that that is ACT and CFT. So um, if you're operating in an urban center, you have to offer ACT, assertive community treatment. If you're in a non-urban setting, you have to offer community um, support, CST, community support team services. Um, also, the providers have to offer supportive employment, supportive housing, bar medications, and evidence-based services. So really you can start to see from these lists, like it's a higher um, obligation. There's additional fidelity requirements. These are really supposed to be kind of a one-stop shop approach for behavioral health conditions where you guys, you might've heard of the integrated health home model. And so this is kind of the next version of that where the, the patient should go to one location and have this comprehensive team team to address all their needs. Uh, within 12 months, there's some additional services you have to offer, ACT, DBT, trauma-informed cognitive behavioral therapy, and EMDR. So that will be a new offering for our population is this EMDR service. Every provider has to have an evidence-informed service plan and what that looks like is you look at your community needs assessment, look at your population and say, these are the best evidence-based treatments for the population we serve. Here's how we're gonna add them, here's the cost. And then the state you know, approves that plan and then will reimburse providers for the cost of adding evidence-based care. So this model keeps moving us forward and keeps moving us towards that evidence-based care model. Peer support has to be offered under both, you know, there's kind of an SUD peer support and then peer support workers, both are covered under the CCBHC. Providers have to have community-based veterans uh, services for veterans. They have to identify that principal behavioral health provider, which comes from the VA requirement and staff have to be trained on military and veterans culture to really make sure that we're delivering those services in a culturally sensitive way. We're on to bucket five. So bucket four was a lot, that was all the services. 
Uh, bucket five is all about data and quality. So if we're going to invest all this money in the system, if we're going to do all this work, is it actually making a difference? Is it better care such that patients are getting better? Um, this is probably the biggest lift for, well, it's one of the bigger lifts for providers. After you build out all the services, after you hire all the staff, you're going to redesign your health record, grab all this data, and then report on it. You should have internal teams that are looking at all of this data to make sure that we're responding and changing services as needed. Um, we're still waiting a little bit from the state to get some additional definition, but um, the CCBHC starts October 1. The reporting year will be January 1 of each year. So the calendar year is when we'll report metrics and hopefully we see some good things. Bucket six is all about governance and accreditation. So you have to be a nonprofit um, or a government entity. The CCBHC has to be informed by clients. So you have to have a mechanism to check in with the clients and the consumers you're serving to say, what can we do better? Um, to have your care informed by the people who are receiving services. <sighs> the criteria is a lot. Let's all take a breath. As far as where we're going from here, these are my predictions now. Um, so we'll see if I'm right. I do think we're going to continue to see expansion of this model. We're going to have more states adopted. So 10 states just got in in 2024. The next time it will open is 2026, and we'll see another 10 states adopt this model in 2026. Um, I expect to see more of the SAMHSA grants. And so we'll see more CCBHCs through the SAMHSA grant. And that's gonna increase access to services. I think we're gonna continue seeing permanent funding and legislation. So right now, Illinois was approved for a four year demonstration. And people ask me a lot, is this going to go away? I don't know. My prediction is CCBHC is here to say, here to stay. I say that for a couple of reasons. The beginning of the presentation, I had that slide with like the four federal laws. We continue to see federal legislation along around this. There's also a lot of lobbying and advocacy around the CCBHC model. So the National Council for Mental Wellbeing is a very big proponent of the CCBHC. They have a loud voice. There's other national trade associations who support this model. There's now over hundreds of CCBHCs um, nationwide. So I think all of those voices will continue to lend support to this model. So I think it's here to stay. I think it's a matter of time before we get um, legislation to make this a permanent model. The state also has the option to make it a permanent model. So right now the state um, HFS is under this four year demonstration. That's where you get to try new things, be innovative, see if it works. If Illinois likes the CCBHC model, we can move it to a permanent part of our Medicaid program. We call it a SPA, which stands for State Plan Amendment. So Illinois through HFS can apply and make, it a per make CCBHC a permanent part of its Medicaid program. If the outcomes are there, I think I, you know, my prediction is I would see Illinois moving that direction. I think we'll continue to enhance our data capabilities. I really want that longitudinal data to show people get better over time. I think that's just a matter of time where we get more of that, um, more of that information to show that yes, our costs go down when we invest proactively on the front end. We're gonna keep uh, focusing on workforce development. We need innovative workforce development strategies to meet the need to expand services. So I think that can be helping develop new practitioners. I think that can be like tuition reimbursement programs for taking current practitioners and getting them you know, another credential, the next licensure. I think it can also be things like how do we take evidence-based treatment and add those services into our current workforce? Like that's trainings, right? Let's teach you on this new evidence-based therapy. We're gonna keep seeing work on crisis services. Illinois is doing a ton of work right now on crisis services and expanding all of it. I think there's a lot of people that are involved in this. And so with CCBHC, we'll just continue having those services of how do all these crisis services work together 
um, for a really integrated system so that anybody can pick up the phone, have someone to call, someone to answer, somewhere to go. This, is, this last bullet point is probably my wildest prediction. I think we'll continue seeing expanded service scope. So right now we're primarily focused on mental health and addiction treatment. I think as this model gets built out more, we'll have the conversations of how do we address unmet needs for autism, eating disorder, or other underserved populations. This could be a really good model to address those conditions as well. Are you guys exhausted? That was a ton of information. I'm happy to answer any questions. I think we're, we've got a, we can informally, if somebody wants to raise their hand or ask a question, shoot. Great job, by the way, Kelly. It was very informative, so thank you. Thank you. Got a question from Amy. Hello. <clears throat> um, so actually, I have two quick questions. Um, is the new payment structure for Illinois, the PPS1, is that in place or is that something they're working towards? That should take effect October 1. Okay. And is that does that only apply to the agencies participating in the demonstration grant? Yes. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So I, I'm expecting this will... I'm expecting there to be more conversations between mental health boards, providers, and grantees because this does change what you fund today, right? Um, and so I just wanted to make sure you had some of the knowledge base, understood some of the terms, the acronyms. I'm so sorry if I spoke too much in acronyms. Um, I just really hope this kind of helps the conversation so that, you know, ideally mental health boards can step into maybe a different space then. Um, if services are now funded in a more comprehensive way with a sustainable funding model, um, what are the needs next? How do we continue building capacity, building workforce? Um, so yeah, I hope this leads to some really good conversation. Do we have any other questions or comments or anything? And Kelly, would it be possible to have a copy of the slide deck and we can share that out to, to members. I think that would be great. It's got a lot of great information in it, so. Absolutely, I will send you the slide deck and please, if you have any questions that come up afterwards, um, I think you all have my contact information um, and Jody, if it would be appropriate, you can share my contact information. Please call with any questions or comments. I'm happy to talk all things CCBHC. <laughs> Appreciate it. Again, thank you. It was very informative. Appreciate all the information that you shared and the time that you took to, to be here with us today. So, and thanks to everybody that joined us online. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day. Thank you. Bye-bye.